Thank you. Um, from you, ladies and gentlemen, like Glenn, it's a pleasure to be here on an occasion when you celebrate not only the 10th anniversary of the Mori Museum, but obviously also the 10th anniversary of Rapongi Hills, an incredible vision created by Minoru Mori, inspired, of course, by his love of Le Corbusier, but already a treasured place within the city of Tokyo. Sadly, I was not here this morning. I came from London, having had to be in London until late last night for the Freeze Art Fair and meetings of our International Council. But I want to pick up from where uh, some of the points that have just been raised by Glenn and to remind you that Tate Modern is only now 13 years old. It comes in a long history and tradition of museums. Museums, of course, have always been centers of learning, research, and display. But, and they've also equally had a very strong civic role. But that civic role, I think, has changed quite dramatically in the last 20 or 30 years, as Glenn has just been reminding us. That acceleration really began in the 60s, both in terms of the numbers of visitors and the kind of experience that they were seeking. Um, it went further, of course, with the creation of an institution like the Pompidou Centre in Paris, and in particular the way in which that knits into the city. Um, and of course, Bilbao Guggenheim opening in the late 90s was itself not just an explosion in Spain, but obviously set a pattern and has been much admired and indeed copied across the world. When Tate Modern opened in 2000, the ambition, of course, was to create for the first time a proper museum of modern art in, in London, but also to create a new museum in a new part of London, a part of London that had been previously uh, neglected, unbelievably neglected given its central location within the city, and also to create a new kind of space within the museum. And here you see the Turbine Hall, an image that most of you will know very well. This simply reminds us that we are right in the heart of the city, Tate Modern, opposite to St. Paul's Cathedral, surrounded by a number of other cultural institutions, as you see from this plan, right on the river itself, um, but in a part of London which had previously been very much neglected. That is Tate Modern 25 years ago. And you see a number of things. First of all, an industrial site, but also an industrial site surrounded, not by a grid pattern of small streets, but almost working on an industrial scale with large blocks, office blocks, and the whole uh, fabric of the city very much uh, broken by this uh, introduction of massive elements within the fabric, um, mainly in the late 19th century and obviously through into the mid 20th century. That's a reminder that it's not that far from Bankside across the river to the city, the center of wealth in London, sorry, the center of wealth in London and also um, a place with which we had to make a connection at a very early stage. But this is the space that has in a way defined Tate Modern in one element of its work. That is to say, a space in which artists can make installations here, Olafur Eliasson, 10 years ago in 2003, or uh, Carsten Huller in 2006. Both of these immersive I installations, both of them, uh, as have been many of the other installations in this space, very much about the engagement of the individual with the work of art, but also a social experience, and one which, um, as Glenn has also been saying, I'm sure we'll come back to this in the discussion, one in which individuals create their own identity and also seek out um, conversations and indeed uh, exchange with others. Over the past uh, 10 years, Tate Modern has uh, encourage us to think the growth of Tate Modern and the growth of audiences at Tate Modern has encouraged us to think about a number of different changes that are required within the building. And as many of you will be aware, we are in the process now of building an, an extension. The pressures on us in terms of numbers, we receive more than 5 million visitors a year. Um, the 
demands from our audience in terms of thinking about the kinds of conversations they want to have both with artists and with, with each other, the development of the internet and the opportunities that that creates for us have encouraged us to think about new kinds of spaces within in the museum. And as we move forward, we have begun on the process of building this extension. A part opened last year for a year. These are the tank spaces, formerly the oil tanks for the power station, now converted into spaces for installation, performance, conversation, dialogue, discussion, conferences. The most successful event that we held last summer was a conference over, and festival held over a two-week period organized by young people aged between 16 and 24 called Undercurrents in which they invited artists and performers to use these spaces in all kinds of different ways. And it's that which has dr driven us forward also in thinking about the way in which we will use the museum in the f and develop the museum in the future. Here you see a slide of Charles Atlas performing in the space, a work made in homage to Merce Cunningham. Merce Cunningham, of course, a uh, choreographer and dance leader of the dance company that of fundamental importance in the post-1960s period onwards, who had already performed in the Turbine Hall. And this piece in the tanks was a certain homage to Cunningham. Again, another element of, of, of the Charles Atlas performance. In thinking about the uh, extension to Tate Modern, I have to take you back 10 years. Um, in 2001 2 having created Tate Modern, and you see it at the center of the left-hand part of this slide, that gray rectangle um, in the city, opposite to St. Paul's Cathedral, connected by the bridge which we had caused to be built, not directly as part of the project, but as an addition, we became conscious that it was very much uh, landlocked looking out onto the river but not connecting to the other parts of the city and we commissioned Richard Rogers and partners to do a study of the means of communication through the southern part of the city to the south of Tate Modern running down to a very neglected part of London uh, the Elephant and Castle and here you see the plan that they made suggesting that li links could be enormously strengthened by a relatively small number of interventions at the same time, we looked very carefully, and I'm getting really into some detail on urban planning here because I think it's suggestive of the way in which museums can influence cities very directly. You see there a determination that we should establish or indeed re-establish links to the south from Tate Modern, connecting through onto the main thoroughfares and the main points of circulation. In that plan, you'll see uh, to the south of Tate Modern, a series of buildings that were there in 2001 and are no longer there. And when we came to discuss what should replace them, not Tate buildings, but other people's buildings, we managed to persuade the planning authorities that they should make a break exactly where that double-headed arrow occurs. These are the two parts of the city, the rich, successful city of London and the poor Bankside Southwark on the south. And in 2003, we invited a practice with Edward Watson Mann to consider some proposals that developed on the Rogers study with a view to making the improvements I was touching on earlier to this area to the south. And with Edward Watson Mann came up with the notion of the Bankside Urban Forest. Their plan was to take some of those existing routes the viaducts that run beneath the railways, the small streets, the small elements of um, urban fabric that are undeveloped and not built on, and to see whether they could improve the whole context for living in that part of London by a number of small-scale interventions. Here you see a very run-down cafe on a very tight site close to one of these railway viaducts. And here you see the intervention made by Witherford Watson Mann to turn this into a more public space that can work at different times of the year in different weathers. Here, not bright sun, but at least some sun. Another kind of intervention is the greening of the city. 
in a very small plot to build and to create a little orchard or in this small piece of land on the edge of the pavement close to Tate Modern with Ivan and Heather Morrison, we've created, simply by building this screen, a wall, a space, an enclave where events and other activities can take place. New buildings come immediately around us. Here, building by Richard Rogers and partners, changing the scale of the landscape, in, in, changing the scale of the space, giving it a human scale and a human quality by planting, by ensuring that there are small-scale developments such as shops and cafes at ground level, even if there are private residential apartments above. And here, very quickly, an aerial view of Tate Modern um, and the plans for the redevelopment and extension of the building. You see to the left these four, four uh, lozenge-shaped buildings that are the Rogers Towers. You see Tate Modern, you see the turbine hall with its glass roof, and then to the southwest, a new, the new extension rising above those oil tanks. You see just uh, beside them these circular shapes, which are the vestigial elements of the oil tanks as they come above. And this is an image taken 10 days ago of the building as it's rising, a, a pyramid around a central core, which will provide galleries, social spaces, and crucially below, um, the, the, the oil tank spaces for performance. Again, Tam Aldo Tambellini, a film program in the tanks using these spaces, making it possible for the Tate to engage with the way in which artists are developing their ideas about working across disciplines, working with other disciplines within the creative industries, beginning to think more, not just in terms of the static, but also the moving. And here, Anna Teresa de Kiersmacher, the first performance um, in the oil tanks, the recon recapitulation of a work that had been made 20 years ago, performed for a new generation. Again, a reinterpretation, if you like, of what a museum can do. It isn't simply about preserving a work of art as an object which sits on a wall. It is also about the research that is required to re-enact a very important and seminal work that sits within the area which is performance, dance, visual art. Increasingly, we find ourselves covering all these disciplines rather than simply the static visual. And it is that interconnection with the creative industries. It's that way of working with individuals, but also placing them in society. It is about making it possible for people to communicate with one another. Glenn mentioned the MOOCs that MoMA have been working with. We, for the last five years, have been developing through the internet, a whole range of programs with schools across the world. We provide a program which builds on the experience of the Turbine Hall and reaches 40,000 young people every week in schools across, I think it's 19 countries in the world. This is exactly the kind of way in which a museum of modern art is bound to work, I think, in the 21st century. And I look forward to discussing these and other points in the panel discussion that follows. Thank you.